travelers and welcome to the first and stars podcast all my loyal listeners thank you for your continued support and remember click the subscribe button everybody it's an amazing episode because mark guggenheim boards the muller ship you know him as the creator of arrow and legends of tomorrow he's now the writer of torrent from image comics come aboard as we go traversing the stars hello mark thank you so so much for coming to the first and stars podcast hey it's great to be here thanks for having me it's an absolute honor to speak with you, sir. I've been wanting to interview you for a very long time. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, this will be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Indeed. Thank you. So I always start off with a question of inspiration. So what inspired your love of writing and who are your earliest influences? Ooh. Um, well, I tell you, um, what inspired my love of writing? Well, I've always loved reading and I loved comic books and, and reading novels, um, you know, uh, in, in prose, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien was a huge mm. uh, influence and a, a great uh, passion of mine growing up. Um, in terms of comics, it was the work of Marv Wolfman and Bill Mantlo and Frank Miller and John Byrne and Chris Claremont. Um, I came of age really like during the, the height of like the sort of you know, the the heyday of, of the Bronze Age of Marvel, where, you know, you had John Byrne doing Fantastic Four, you had Walt Simonson doing Thor, you had Claremont and a bunch of brilliant artists uh, doing X-Men. Um, Bill Mantlo was doing Micronauts and ROM, and, uh, you know, Marv Wolfman had done a great run on Spider-Man and was doing New Teen Titans. It was just, you know, it was just such a wonderful time to be in comics. And in terms of television, uh, I would say my, my first the first writer I was aware of uh, was uh, a guy named Stephen J. Cannell, who created shows like The A-Team and The Greatest American Hero and Hardcastle McCormick. Um, these are, you know, if you're of a certain age, you know, the, you know, those shows. He was he was the Greg Berlanti of his time. Um, and, uh, you know, as well as Stephen Bochco and David E. Kelly and David J. Burke. Um, yeah, huge, huge influences on me. That's absolutely fantastic. And like I said, like someone like Marv Wolfen, who is doing television and comic books, when you were first pursuing writing, which one was your first thought? TV show writing, screenwriting, or was it comic book writing? Uh, believe it or not, it was TV show writing. Um, you know, I I really wanted to write for comics, but there's, I always say, like, it's actually harder to break in as a comic book writer than it is as a TV writer. Because with, with television, there's there are various on-ramps. You know, there's agents and managers, their staffing season. Um, there are shows that are looking for writers. Comics, there, there are none of those things. Um, so it's not like being a comic book artist where you could go to a convention and have them review your portfolio. No one's going to sit there and read a script. <laughs> so um, comics turned out to be harder to break into. In fact, I, I really broke into comics really through Hollywood. It was, it was my Hollywood work that got me, you know, first noticed. That's kind of funny. For some reason, I always would assume the opposite, that... Um, maybe it's counterintuitive. I figured TV writing would always be because um, it's more lucrative. I figured it'd be also more difficult. Yeah, no, it's a totally fair. Yeah, I recognize how sort of you know counterintuitive this is. Um, but uh, when you when you sort of think about it in terms of okay, well, how does one actually break into either industry? Uh, one has you know clear means of breaking in, the other does absolutely does not. <laughs> now, if if I did my research correctly, you attended the University of Albany in the State of University of New York. Um, you practice law, is that correct? That's right. Yeah, I used to be a lawyer. That is amazing. And luckily, you went to the side of good, and you became a writer instead. <laughs> yeah, I gotta say, like uh, being a lawyer was—it's not a pleasant way to make a living. Uh, and I, I, you know, left, and I, I haven't looked back since. So, what was the interest in practicing law first? Like, what was what led to that, and what led you to eventually escape from it? Ooh, uh, well, it, you know, it's funny. The the thing that led me to escape from it was sort of realizing that the thing that led me to it wasn't really a thing. Um, I, I got into law because I thought it was like a, you know, a more stable career than writing. Um, but primarily I was interested in fairness and notions of justice. And I, I got into law for all the reasons most I, idealists do. Um, and then of course, when you actually start practicing, you realize that all those ideals have no 
part of the legal system. Um, you know, and I got very disillusioned. Um, I would say relatively quickly, but I was in my fifth year of practice when I when I left. So, you know, it took me longer than some friends of mine who used to be lawyers and stopped. They they got with the program a lot quicker than I did. It, I'm I'm slow on the uptake. It took me it took me some time to figure out that I you know, really, really, really didn't uh, like doing this. And the reason I didn't like doing it was it wasn't what I thought I was signing on for. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I just became very disillusioned, but fortunately had this writing thing to kind of fall back on. So I always like to make lines and, and, and connection between what someone has done and what someone is doing. So once again, as someone who started law and studied law, is there a connection between the ability to do that well or and the ability to write well? A little bit. I mean, there's, I used to be a litigator. So that's a, you know, that that's, that's like a trial attorney. So that's very different from practicing mergers and acquisitions or, um, you know, or, or doing trust and estate work, um, you know, transactional law, uh, real estate law, for example, is transactional. Um, so when you're a litigator, you do have to do a lot of writing because you're writing briefs and memorandas and, you know, you're writing answers to interrogatories and discovery requests. So there's a certain amount of writing that, that is involved. Um, but I would say that there's a very straight line between the work I do as a showrunner and the work I did as a litigator. There, there's mm -hmm. a lot of skills I learned as a litigator that moved over pretty seamlessly uh, to being, you know, a showrunner. You know, I... And I may be wrong on this, but I kind of I always think that a lawyer, much like a a writer or even in the teacher like myself, is the importance of the meaning of words. Has that yes. also translated into an understanding of the writing and purposeful writing when you're doing your your script writing? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think anyone who has an appreciation for language as an art form, I think, uh, you know, is is inclined towards fictional or creative writing. Um, there's obviously a lot more that, that goes into it, um, you know, than, you know, there's there's story and plot and how to, you know, derive conflict, you know, drama out of conflict. Um, so there's some overlap, but it's not a perfect, you know, Venn diagram. So you, I mean, since your time in writing, you, you're extremely prolific. You have a lot of shows you write for, comic books, things of that nature. I think um, just recently you have, is it two ongoings and a graphic novel um, that, that are recent? Um, let's see. I've got uh, an ongoing from Image Comics called Torrent that is coming out later in February. Um, I have a graphic novel from Image uh, that just got published last month, uh, as well as a graphic novel from Dark Horse that uh, came out in comic book stores last week, and then next week it will be in bookstores. So, so you know, we've got everything. So when, when you're that prolific and you got that many stories going on, is it difficult to balance those diverse properties? And when you're thinking about things in a creative sense, is there an issue with one idea tugging on you harder than the other? It's like when you're trying to work on one project, you have this other germ that's kind of like pushing on you. Um, no, because I kind of, one of the reasons I like doing multiple projects at once is that if I get stuck on one thing, I can go to something else. So I can always be productive. Um, I, I will say that, you know, the, the biggest challenge, honestly, with having so much content come out in such short succession is uh, I, I do don't have the time that I need to adequately promote any of the books. Mm. Um, and that's a challenge because promotion and self-promotion is not something I'm particularly good at anyway. Um, so the fact that all these, you know, happen, it, it, you know, this is just pure happenstance. This, this wasn't planned. Um, but the fact that, you know, in the space of, you know, three months, you know, three separate projects are going to come out. Um, that's not ideal um, because in, in a perfect world, I'm, taking time out of my day to do a variety of different ways of promoting any of the books. Uh, it's hard to do that with multiple projects. And like I said, I'm not good at it to begin with. I, you know, if I've got time in my day, I usually am spending it writing something, not, mm -hmm. you know, promoting something I've written. Well, I'm glad you found the time uh, tonight because it's been a pleasure so far. Um, mm -hmm. So you're currently the writer, as you mentioned, a new series called Torrent from Image Comic Books. So what inspired the creation of this series? You know, that one actually started as just like a thought experiment. Um, I I was thinking one day about the nature of, of you know, a superhero like Spider-Man versus the nature of a superhero like Batman or the Punisher. 
And I, I kind of got just sort of intrigued by the question of how would, what would it take to turn character A into character B? Mm. Um, and, and is there a story there? And what was really kind of cool about Torrent is, is that from that very simple story, a much more layered and complex, you know, narrative about the nature of heroism um, and the line between heroism and villainy started to emerge. And that was, uh, you know, kind of intriguing and, and fun for me. So, um, you know, when I started talking to Justin Greenwood about uh, collaborating on another book together, um, that was uh, an idea that was, was kind of at the forefront of my mind. Um, and I, I pitched it to him and, and he liked it. So I wrote up a, you know, like a short document that sort of at the time was, was kind of like my, my, you know, sort of all my thinking on this, you know, on this idea, uh, to date, which would basically turned out to be like, you know, sort of the pitch for the, for the series, as well as, you know, the first arc, which is the first five issues. I think that's fantastic that you also work with someone who you worked with before, now, is there a benefit into working with someone who you've already know and have a partnership with previously? And what can th that add to the project? Well, it's always ideal when I can sit down to write a comic book script and be able to sort of visualize the artist's work in my head. Um, because then I know, like, I know what their strengths are. I know what their weaknesses are. I know what they like to draw. Um, I know what, what it's going to look like, you know, generally speaking on the page. Um, sometimes you get to do that. Sometimes you don't like um, in the case of like Two Dead to Die, which was the graphic novel uh, that I did with Image and Howard Chaikin that came out last month. Or I used to have to say uh, December, um, which came out in December. Um, that was something I just started writing at the start of the pandemic on spec um, and about, you know, 20 pages in or so. I realized the art I was seeing in my mind's eye as I was writing was Howard's. Um, so that, that was a situation where I didn't know who I was writing it for until I did. And then I was lucky enough that Howard was, you know, game to work on it with me. Yeah. The cool thing about that is that, uh, obviously Howard uh, Shaken, he's also a famous writer in his own right. Yes. What is it like writing for an artist who's also a, a, a very good, great writer as well? Well, you know, I'll tell you, it's intimidating writing for Howard on multiple levels, uh, you know, not the least of which is that he's a genius. I mean, he's a genius as a writer and he's a genius as an artist um, and he's someone who, you know, it, it's weird to write for your hero. Um, that's that's a that's a strange experience. Um, I, you know, when I am in those kinds of situations, I have this tendency to deal with them by uh, simply burying my head in the sand and pretending that I'm actually not writing for one of my heroes um, or I'm not writing, you know, like a Star Wars character or I'm not, you know, writing Superman. So um, ignorance is bliss, but I think sometimes you can sort of force ignorance uh, when you really have to. Now, when you're writing with Howard uh, Shaken, did he ever send notes like, that's how I would write this? <laughs> you know, like, no. let's not do this. No, actually, Howard, I, this is my, you know, this is, Technically, it's like my fifth thing that I've collaborated with with Howard on, and it um, he he's always so gracious, and he he never uh, he never gives notes. Uh, he never um, says, "Oh, I would do this differently." Um, he's very content to you know to let me tell the story from a writing perspective, and he'll tell the story from an art perspective. You know, I think what's very interesting about this partnership between you and Howard Shaken is that on the one hand, at least maybe I might be wrong, but in my opinion, um, a artist like Howard Shaken, because he's also you know, a writer who's also an artist, is better visually than a regular writer. However, as a, someone who writes scripts for TV shows, you also have to be very visual as well, that maybe more than a regular writer would be. So how does that enhance the partnership as well? It's a good question. I mean, I... You know, it's funny, I, I've, I've often thought about my comic book writing enhancing my Hollywood work. I very rarely think about it in the reverse, um, mm. but I'm sure, both, you know, both are true. But like, you know, when I'm uh, editing a, a cut or when I'm directing an episode, um, I feel like a lot of my comic book, uh, you know, my a lot of my comic book experience comes to bear because, you know, what what is a comic book if not a, a storyboard in other form, you know? Mm. Um, so, uh, but I, I think, you know, like, I think, I think, you know, one hand washes the other, you know, the, there's a lot of different advantages to 
being able to work in different mediums. And, and one of them, I think, is just the fact that everything you do is always a learning experience for everything else you do. Um, and, and everything, hopefully, is, is, you know, serving to make me a better writer. Well, like I said, I mean, your writing has obviously been extraordinary. And one thing I found that very interesting in reading the synopsis on Torrent, um, and maybe I don't know, um, clarify on it, it's being discussed as being a brand new superhero universe, which is the important phrase be word being universe. So can you go a little more detail on what that means exactly for Torrent? Yeah. Um, well, it's it's kind of interesting because there's a lot of like there's a lot of similarities that Torrent has with Arrow, uh, mm -hmm. the, the CW show that Greg Berlanti and I did. Um, so it, it's it's similar to Arrow in terms of tone, the the exploration of, you know, the ethics of violence. Um, but in in sort of just working out the first arc, I kind of realized that to tell the story I wanted to tell, I I needed to populate um, this city that the that the uh, comic book takes place in with other superheroes. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I wanted you know I wanted the Avengers or the Justice League to try to stop Spider Man um, from whatever he was trying to do. So um, the you know, kind of by accident, we, we sort of, just like with Arrow, we kind of stumbled into a universe um, because, you know, in success, we have the ability to use Torrent as a building block for a larger, you know, a larger superhero landscape, um, which is kind of the way I like to build out a universe. I, I like, you know, with, with Arrow, we always said we built the house brick by brick, you know, we, we didn't, you know, start off with Justice League. We started off with one guy with a bow and arrow and slowly over time, you know, built and added different pieces. And sometimes the pieces were from other shows. Sometimes the pieces were from an animated show. You know, um, it just allowed itself to grow organically. Um, and that that would be my hope for for Torrent. You know, I, I'm one of my pet peeves about universe creation, uh, if I can put it that way, is is people trying to, you know, run before they can walk. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it, and, and I don't like to put the heart, you know, the cart before the horse. I, you know, you know, tell, tell a good story. Like our, our goal was, you know, we, we didn't think about anything other than the first five issues, that first arc, um, you know, and, and when you see then the second arc, you'll see that the world gets bigger, um, but again, not in a crazy exponential way, but in an organic, okay, we, we told a story this big in the first arc, and now we're telling a story this big in the second arc. And, you know, hopefully it will continue to expand and the narrative will continue to grow. So when you're talking about comic book universe, you mean inclusive into the story of Torrent, or are you talking about additional titles, spinoffs, things of that nature that will form, let's say, well, I mean, big picture DC Marvel universe yeah well i think i think in you know in success it would be great to you know spin off the book into you know two books and then you know when that feels right you hopefully spin it off into three books but again it, like just like with arrow there's no like our eyes are on the prize our eyes are on the ball of you know let's let's just make one it's hard enough to make one really great book um so that's that's what we're attempting to do so within this the universe of torrent how are you differentiating it from the, from other comic book universes that are out there? What makes yours unique either in tone, style? You know, it's, it's, I think what we're doing, I haven't seen what, I haven't seen anyone else try to do this before, which is we're kind of taking characters that would feel very much at home in the Bronze Age of comics, mm. but telling a story with, you know, sort of modern you know, 21st century sensibilities and techniques, um, it, you know, kind of in the way that like, you know, if, if Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, told a story that was very much rooted in the, the, the serials of the 1930s, but felt like a 1980 movie uh, or 1983 movie, I forget when it came out, 82, um, 82, I think it was. Um, you know, it, it was kind of, you know, that's kind of like what we're going for. Something that feels old, but also brand new. So Tor centers around a character named Michelle Metcalf, um, AKA uh, Cracker Jack. Mm -hmm. um, so what initially prompts her to be a superhero? 
Um, well, you know, it's funny. Uh, in in future issues, we're going to hopefully get into her secret origin and her backstory. One of the things that uh, I really wanted to do was kind of um, kind of like in the old, you know, DC Golden Age uh, books, not be upfront with her origin originally. Um, you know, when when Superman first appeared, in, you know, in Action Comics, you, it was just Superman, you know, Batman, just Batman. And then later on, you learned, you know, you know, later on, you learned Batman's origin. Um, I, I, you know, I kind of want to establish, um, you know, Michelle as a superhero, start taking her down this dark path. And then in the second or maybe even the third arc, once she's, you know, completely descended into chaos and violence, then I think it'd be very interesting to go back and tell the story of how she became a uh, superhero. Now, once again, in the synopsis, um, she described, at least initially, because I know things change later on, as being happy-go-lucky. Now, how does that represent her, her initial worldview of herself, the world that she lives in? And is the world at that moment a reflection of this, of her worldview or her perspective at the beginning? Well, I think the thing that Michelle discovers in the very first issue is that the world is very different from her, her worldview. I think, I think she sort of goes into it with this kind of, you know, rose colored glasses view of, of super heroics is like, this is fun. You're an adventurer, you know? Um, and then uh, she discovers that at least the city that she lives in is particularly, um, you know, is particularly uh, dark and um, difficult and not at all um, what, you know, she thought she was prepared for. Well, I, I know they also introduced a, a psychic, a slipstream. How does he, where does, where does he fit in her current or initial uh, worldview of things? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I think, you know, he actually, I think, Originally, he actually doesn't fit into her worldview. Uh, he's more of an, an annoyance. He's a nuisance. Uh, he's someone who's sort of like, if she's, you know, if she's Batman, uh, he is auditioning to be Robin. Uh, or if she's Captain America, he's auditioning to be Bucky. And uh, she's like, I don't want a sidekick. Um, and there we get some fun uh, interplay between the two of them in the first issue um, over, you know, his, his you know, kind of... Uh, you know, very strident um, attempts to get brought on as as the sidekick. Well, um, once again, I, in the story, I said this a tragedy causes her to cross the line from hero to vigilante. So for our listeners, can you define how you define that difference? Well, it's funny. I, that's the thing, actually. Like, I, I don't have the difference boiled down to a single sentence. It's, it's, it's actually, that's that's kind of, the that that's what I spent eight years exploring on Arrow, and it's my hope to spend many number of years uh, uh, exploring it on in this book. Uh, I that's I don't see it as a binary type of thing or or something that um, I can or even want to distill down to a single sentence. For me, it's it's a spectrum, and where someone falls on that spectrum. And I think that can move also over time, you know, in, in either direction or both directions. To watch that happen, that to me is the fodder of, you know, really interesting stories. So this event that is the very tragic event, how has that compromised her view of what justice is? And is this change in how she views it justice immutable? Or at some point, is, is there hope or a light that, can move back towards where she came from or once this change has been made there is no going back well i don't want to answer the question by saying you have to read the book but i will say that issue three uh is pretty much the entirety of the issue deals with the limitations of the criminal justice system and the limitations of what the law can actually do both in terms of preventing and in terms of getting justice for victims. Um, and uh, again, like I said, I, I sort of see this as very rich, you know, territory and rich fodder for telling stories. Um, you know, I could have, you know, told the events of issue three across, you know, six issues, um, you know, because I, I do think it's so complex and nuanced and, and interesting. Um, and, and that really is the, you know, that that's, that's the sort of the spine that, that underlies 
you know, at least the first arc, but, you know, as I start working on the second arc, I think it will, will start to, you know, continue it in the second arc as well of, you know, what, what does it mean to, you know, be a vigilante versus a hero? What does it, why, what makes vigilantes necessary? I, is it because there are, you know, shortcomings to the legal system? Um, and if so, how do we feel about that? Like, you know, mm -hmm. we're supposed to like the legal system. We're supposed to, you know, I, I guess this sort of, you know, harkens back to my work as an attorney. I, I didn't practice criminal law, but uh, I still, you know, found the legal system was, you know, inadequate in so many different instances. Um, and I, I find it, you know, I find that fascinating and I find what we do to make up for those things uh fascinating as well um it's it, it it to me it's all part and parcel of the same delicious mess it's, mm -hmm. it is a mess it's fun to to pull at it and and examine it from different angles so the, the life of a superhero you assume has an element of tragedy within it in other words you're trying to rescue people some you're successful at some not some you need to rescue because something has bad has happened to those around them so for um cracker jack is what is about this tragedy that's so unconscionable that she that this breaks her as it were well um i'll tell you because it you know i don't i don't you know it's it's in the first issue and uh i you know is it a spoiler i guess for the first issue but um you know for the entire series it's not because it happens right at the front basically her son gets kidnapped and her husband is killed um so it, the tragedies are are very personal to her um, and the, the reason I had the son abducted and not killed as well was I wanted to place her in a position where she had to do something proactive, um, that it's not just vengeance, it's, it's protective. It's her trying to, you know, save her son, uh, which, you know, there's nothing more visceral than, than a parent trying mm -hmm. to save their child. Um, and, you know, it, it's in that regard that she really does come up against not only the limits of the criminal justice system, like I said, but also the limits of her own capacity. Now, without knowing her backstory, is this the first time she's felt personal tragedy? Um, yeah, that's pretty much the way I've been, you know, writing her, you know, that, that this is someone who hasn't had to deal with you know, something this horrible before. Um, like I said, her worldview is kind of, you know, happy-go-lucky or it's sort of rose-colored glasses, little Pollyanna-ish. Um, and this is despite the fact that she it lives in at very least a city, if not an entire world, that isn't as, you know, kind and gentle as, uh, you know, as, as she's led, you know, to, to it, you know, believed it to be. It's, it's, you know, uh, there's there's a little bit, not not a lot, and I try to be very light about it. Um, but there's a little bit of meta commentary, um, you know, in the story that we're telling, where we're, we're like I said, taking a Bronze Age character and kind of putting them in a modern set of circumstances. Mm. Uh, so it's not just the the way we tell the story, but the story itself is a modern story. So she is, you know, to be sort of very reductive about it, you're taking a character from like the 70s and 80s and forcing them to deal with the villains of, you know, the 2020s. Um, mm. Really, really, really big difference there. Um, but again, that to me is part of the, the fun of it. So having now dealt with tragedy, potentially for the first time or personal tragedy for the first time, now being a superhero and dealing with other or uh, other individuals who've had tragedy or people or victims or things of that nature does this give her also an understanding is there a positive aspect to it that she has an understanding now of what she's others are now dealing with that she's trying to protect well you know i think eventually um it will will end up sort of telling that story um we don't in the first five issues but that's you know that that's just a question of sort of where our our focal lens is so how does the change in her affect those around her in the superhero world um, it ain't good. Uh, let me put it <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it actually will bring her very into conflict uh, with the people that she thought were friends. Uh, and in the case of one, what one's even a former lover. Um, and there is just a huge amount of conflict there. But it, it's goes that conflict is is bilateral um on the one hand you know michelle is doing something that is very clearly crossing a line as far as they're concerned 
But on the other hand, Michelle feels that she has to do it because the people that she thought were her friends, her fellow heroes, aren't, you know, willing to go the distance that she feels uh, they need to go. And and on some level, she feels like she's entitled to expect them to go. Now, these other heroes that are around her, are they also, as as you mentioned, a Bronze Age style hero or are they slightly more modern than she is? Um, I would say they're they're mostly bronze age there's there's one or two that i think you can make the argument that they're a bit more modern um but i i think they have that you know kind of that bronze age kind of feel to it they certainly uh are approaching the circumstances that michelle finds herself in with a bronze age kind of idealism and you know one might you know one person's idealism is another person's naivete Mm. So their so their view so their worldview is more black and white, and that's the issue they have. Is it also is there is the fear of what happened to her impacting at all the view of the others around her in the superhero community? No, I think I know, and I think that that's a problem for Michelle. I think I think she you know I, I think she she has a lot of reasons, like I said, to be disappointed in her her fellow heroes and her you know her friends. Um, and at the same time, it, they are, they're not wrong either. <laughs> um, you know, they, they, they have some very, they, they're making good points. You know, I, I tried very hard to, you know, it's superheroes. So eventually the conflict becomes, you know, action. But um, before we get there, the, the conflict is, it's very nuanced. Um, you know, there are good arguments on both sides. Michelle is, is right uh, in a lot of respects, but she's also wrong in a lot of other respects. So within the context of the story, are these other superheroes as similarly a antagonist as the villains are that she's facing? Um, well, I don't want to spoil too much, but uh, it, it, like I said, ev- eventually um, it's it's superheroes. Um, so eventually there will be punches, punches exchanged. Very cool. Like I said, it sounds like a, a, a tremendous. Um, I had the pleasure of reading the, a preview of it. It's a fantastic sound, uh, fantastic comic book. So I've enjoyed reading it. So when can our listeners get their hands on it? And are we talking monthly, five months straight? Are we talking bi monthly, or is it sort of like Saga, where the issues break issues? So uh, the first issue of Torrent comes out on February 15th, and uh, we're going to be monthly. And because we've already got the first part, the first five issues in the can already, um, you know that we're going to be able to hit our monthly schedule because um, everything, you know, we're just we're operating so far ahead of, of publication. Um, so it's, you know, and again, that, that was very much by design because you know, there's, like I said, there's a bit of a Bronze Age kind of feel to it. And and it was important, Justin and I, to have the reading experience be a little bit Bronze age too. You know, like, you know, you're getting a new issue every month. Um, and I'm organizing things so that each arc is basically five issues long. So you know that every five issues, you're going to get a, a different, um, you know, a different, you know, story with a beginning, middle and end. Um, and I'm I'm trying the, the sort of challenge I've sort of set for myself with this one is to write each arc with an end that makes you feel like there's no way the book can continue. So mm-hmm. issue five uh, has an ending that hopefully people will be like, how's there possibly going to be an issue six? And issue 10 will have an ending where people hopefully go, how could there possibly be an issue 11? Um, and that's, you know, that, that's sort of, uh, the, that, that kind of cadence and that narrative, uh, unpredictability is, is part of, you know, what I actually really loved about, you know, Bronze Age comics. Um, you know, it's, it's so hard to do things now that truly surprise the reader. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, I remember like the death of Jean Grey and Uncanny X-Men 137, like no one saw that coming. And because, Characters were never killed off. Um, so I, I, I would love to try to recapture a little bit of that unpredictability. Uh, that's that's my goal. That's where I sort of set the bar for myself. Well, like I said, Torin sounds awesome. I hope our listeners pick up the issues. And I want to thank you so much, sir, for uh, stopping to talk with me. This has been fantastic. Oh, it's been my pleasure. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much. You too.